So our last response, th thanks to Kat, and our last responser is Matthew Potts, um, who joined the faculty of HDS this year um, as an assistant professor of ministry studies, and he's an ordained priest in the Episcopal Church. Studies the practices of Christian communities with a focus on the relationship between liturgy and ethics. Particularly seeks to analyze the, and interpret Christian sacramental practices while employing the resources of literature, literary theory, and contemporary theology. So thanks a lot, Matt. Thank you. It, it is truly an honor to share this uh, this podium uh, with with this panel. Um, to be honest, it's a bit of a fright also. Uh, <laughs> six months ago, I was a student. I would have been sitting where you are, and now you have to listen to me uh, talk to you. Um, but also because I'm not a scholar of Paul. Uh, I'm not a scholar of the New Testament. I'm not a scholar of early Christianity. And it is highly likely that I will wander into some of those debates that, that Professor Wright warned us about uh, when he gave his, his talk. Um, and also, as, as, as Giovanni said, just saying this off the cuff, as Giovanni said, uh, I am an Episcopal priest, and so I can feel sort of the Episcopal oversight uh, from, <laughs> from my left. My response to, to Professor Wright will try to engage his work where it intersects my own. Um, I'm going to take up the account of religion that he spoke about in Chapter 13 of, of his work. Um, and, and, and talk a bit about how he sees Paul relating to the Roman concept of religion. And then I'm going to offer two reactions of my own. The first, theological, coming out of my own sort of theological training in modern Protestant theology. Um, but then the other, pastoral, or maybe ministerial, or ecclesiological, or something. Briefly put, Professor Wright argues that most modern Protestant readings of Paul are indebted to an anachronistic and incorrect and probably Bartian uh, distinction between something called religion on the one hand and something called revelation on the other. And that while the latter, revelation, is true and truly Christian, the former religion is precisely what Christianity supersedes. This is, this is the false construct of sort of a latter day 18th century understanding. These readings, according to Bishop Wright, fundamentally misconstrue Paul's rhetorical redeployment and reimagining of Roman sacrifice. And although Professor Wright is no doubt correct that this division too lazily divides much Protestant thought, and while he shows in his work how we might read Paul's Jewish appropriation of Roman religion as troubling this lazy sort of Protestant divide, I believe that the manner in which Professor Wright reads Paul's religio, in fact, accords with the best of modern Protestant, even modern Bartian thought. <laughs> and that the implications of this Pauline and Bartian thinking are crucial for our understanding of how the church is formed, or better, for who forms the church. So first, let me briefly recount what I believe Professor Wright is saying in this 13th chapter, and I'll count on his oversight in, in the follow-on to correct me if I'm wrong. He writes that in the Roman world, religion was not a way of teaching people how to behave, for that, you might go to the philosophers. It was not in itself a way of deciding actual policy, except for the inter in, uh, occasional intervention from augury or oracles. It was innately conservative in that it emphasized the ultimate good of civic peace and harmony and offered the means by which that could be maintained, since the gods were themselves deemed to be part of the overall social fabric. This is just a different version of what he said in his remarks. Religion and religious sacrifice in particular were means of binding gods and peoples together, of drawing the divine and the human into a single cohesive sociality. Thus, the ancient accusation that Christians were atheists for the refusal to offer the customary sacrifices, since, in his words, atheists were, by definition, people who were not playing their part in keeping the gods and the city together. At our first glance, then, it seems that the ancient Romans will agree with modern Protestants. Christians were irreligious at least in this sense. But here Professor Wright, I think, reads more deeply and discovers that the word religion, or religio, is entirely appropriate to and for Paul. Because if religion is about the binding together of gods and peoples, then in his words, there clearly were various things that Paul and his followers did which he regarded as binding them closely not only to one another, but to the one God, the one Lord whom they worshiped, 
If a religion in the ancient world was the system of signs, including myths and rites by which people were bound together as a civic unity, then it is evident that Paul says the common life of those in Christo was precisely that, a united community whose complex unity was both expressed in and powerfully reinforced by this radically new kind of sacrifice, and particularly the special and symbolic rites of baptism and Eucharist. End quote. If this is the case, then modern Protestant conceptualizations of religion, which enfold additional pursuits like philosophy and theology and ethics and various cultural patterns of behavior, those ideas of religion, as well as other ideas, sort of evangelical ideas of religion, which set a living relationship with God against the moribund outward form of ritual, these conceptions of religion, on Professor Wright's account, are just not so helpful in reading Paul. Paul, in his words again, Paul's religio was the means by which he believed that the one God who had made himself known in and through the one Lord and was active by the one spirit was binding the single community to himself, much as the religio of Rome was supposed to bind gods and mortals together in a single theopolitical harmony. Whatever modern Protestantism might make of religion for Paul, it was crucial, at least rhetorically cru crucial, and it was in appropriating this Roman sacrificial trope through Jewish faith and around Jesus Christ, reworking it around Jesus Christ, that Paul described the unified life of the Christian community with one another and with God. Professor Wright reads passages from the Pauline letters uh, concerning baptism and Eucharist, uh, especially from 1 Corinthians at length and with detail that I do not have time here to recount. But since my field is the sacraments, I can't resist just a brief, a brief summary of what, what his argument is or what his reading is. According to Professor Wright, for Paul, the Messiah's people are the new Exodus people, these are his words, formed as was ancient Israel into a people by the redeeming action of the one God, the action of the one God on their behalf and by the sovereign and holy presence of the one God in their midst. When in passages like 1 Corinthians 10, Paul writes that our fathers and mothers were all under the cloud and all went into the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea it becomes clear to us that baptism is indeed the outward and visible sign of entry into the Messiah's people, defining them just as surely as the crossing of the Red Sea defined the people of Abraham's God brought out of Egypt, end quote. On this view, according to Professor Wright, the religious act of baptism, resonating with the ancient myth of Exodus, now reworked around Jesus and the Spirit, binds the baptized to the one God and constitutes them as an actual, not merely a theoretical or an invisible, community. In Professor Wright's words, any intelligent Roman hearing all this would say, this is religio. <coughs> all right. The religio of Eucharistic sacrifice follows much the same logic. Insofar as for Paul, Eucharistic practice establishes the cohesion of the Christian community with Christ insofar as it binds God and humans together, it matches the basic Roman religious understanding, however much it resists actual Roman practice. Once again, Latter-day Reformation anxieties over terms like sacrifice, which read that in that word a troubling sort of theurgy, these are entirely beside the point for Paul. For Paul, religious sacrifice is a festive binding of God to humans through ritual, a ritual quote, Paul sees fulfilled and transformed in and through Jesus. The Eucharist is thus the prime locus of that binding and transformation. Here again is Professor Wright interpreting 1 Corinthians 11 uh, in view of Eucharist. The Eucharist thus clearly functions for Paul as a rite, complete with traditional root words, as a rite in which a founding myth was rehearsed, though in this case the founding myth was an actual event that had occurred not long ago as a rite in which the worshipers share the life of the divinity being worshipped, though the divinity in question is a human being of recent memory, as a rite dependent on a prior sacrifice, albeit the very strange one of the crucifixion of that same human being, as a rite which should bind the community together so that the signs of disunity during the rite are a contradiction of its inner meaning, as a rite which, if thus performed wrong, will have bad consequences for that community. Once again, in Professor Wright's words, any pagan who heard and grasped what Paul was saying here could conclude from each of these components, components that this was indeed part of a religio, part of a religion, even though it was quite unlike anything else they had seen before. 
So that, that's, that's for my summary. It's clear from the above, I think, that the basic structure of Roman religion, of the ritual binding together of humans to one another and to God, is preserved in Paul's discussion of ritual acts, such as baptism and Eucharist, however much they are reformed and reworked by Paul around Christ. It's also clear that certain Protestant rejections of the religious, certain Protestant interpretations of the New Testament and the Pauline writings, certain Protestant anxieties over things like sacrifice are quite anachronistic to this literature. But I want to return to this idea of reworking religion in and through Christ, because though I think Professor Wright is correct in his reading of Paul, I read something very similar in the figures of the Protestant Reformation. And among advocates for revelation against so-called religion, such as Karl Barth. For all their Protestant anxieties, they too, I think, regard religion as reformed around, not rejected in lieu of Jesus Christ. I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to lean heavily upon the scholarship of my predecessor in this appointment as professor of worship here at Harvard, Matthew Meyer Bolton. It's true, of course, that a figure like Karl Barth can be very easily read, perhaps must be read, against religion. Indeed, there is perhaps no better reader of Barth than Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who himself wrote from Tegel Prison that Barth, quote, called the God of Jesus Christ into the lists against religion. This was and is his greatest service. Indeed, Bonhoeffer's own and well-known religionless Christianity perhaps inherits some of this sentiment. But Matthew Meyer Bolton, my predecessor here, has cogently and persuasively argued that what Barth is up to is in fact much more creative than a simple opposition between something called revelation and something called religion. Indeed, what Bolton sees Barth doing looks a lot more like the reworking at play in Professor Wright's Paul. For Barth, quoting Bolton now, there is no religionless way of life, and certainly no religionless Christianity. Any simple and apparently radical war against religion, as Barth puts it in the Epistle to the Romans, is only a pseudo-radicalism only a sideways step into another religious form, for as soon as we begin to specify the protocols, values, and regulations of such religionlessness, we thereby take up again a religious project, formulating and following a particular way of life, a program for righteousness, and therefore another perfectly religious form of Christianity." End quote. There is no escaping religion for Bart. According to Bolton, Bart is therefore against religion not by annihilating it, but by transforming it from within. This, to me, echoes the strategy Professor Wright reads in Paul. Paul's worldview refreshed and reworked in Christ. Paul sees religio fulfilled and transformed in and through Jesus, and so does Karl Barth. What's crucial for Barth and for Paul both is the binding of Christ to the worshiping community. We humans, with our religion, as with so many other things, turn against God. But for Barth, God meets us in that very turning. On Bart's view, the incarnation joins Jesus' voice to ours in worship. For Bart, God the Father hears our prayers and prays in worship, hears our religious speech, quote, because as he hears us, our weak and dissonant voices are sustained by the strong voice of the one by whose Eucharist the inadequacy of ours is covered and glorified in advance. In our doubtful praise, he hears his own voice. In our voices, with all our false notes, the Father hears his own pure voice. As Matt Bolton explains, human religious speech, unsound as it may be, is not obliterated, but sustained, strengthened, accompanied by divine speech. Human beings do take their stand, but only by standing with God the Son, participating in his calling upon his Father. Or to use the words of John Calvin, we pray by his mouth. The grace of God binds humans to Jesus Christ, so much so that our own human religion gets taken up by Christ, reformed, refreshed, reworked, to use some of Professor Wright's lovely language, by him. What's crucial for Bart is Jesus Christ, as also for Bonhoeffer, whose own religionless Christianity was also only so to the, degree, to the degree that it was conformed to Christ. We might then use Professor Wright's own words about Paul to describe Karl Barth. This religion is the means by which Bart believes that the one God, who has made himself known in and through the one Lord, and is active by the one Spirit, is binding this single community to himself. If, as Professor Wright claims, any intelligent Roman would have recognized Paul's religion, then we might be surprised at how familiar Karl Barth's liturgical theology might have looked to that Roman, too. <laughs> it is the peculiar luxury of respondents like myself 
that when eminent scholars publish 1,700-page mag <laughs> books and visit our institutions, that we get to share a stage with them, single out a passing reference to Karl Barth, and then pursue our own intellectual purpose for a few, <laughs> for a few minutes. And it's possible, as he warned, it's possible that I've gotten too deep into the de details and sort of missed the larger picture. Uh, as I noted from my beginning, my own field is sacramental theology, so I was naturally drawn to these very interesting and compelling words about bapt baptism and Eucharist and their relation to quote-unquote religion, so-called religion. I think Professor Wright's reading of Paul and of Paul's interpreters is sound, but I also think it loudly resounds in the best of the Protestant tradition, too. For Paul, Bart, uh, and I, and Professor Wright all believe, I think, that, that baptism and Eucharist are the means by which the Christian community is bound to one another and to God. Which leads me then, in closing, to the pastoral question that I promised you at the beginning of my remarks. If Christian religious actions, and in particular the sacramental acts of baptism and Eucharist, are activities taken up by God to bind us to God, then what does this say about the constitution of the church? Baptism and Eucharist on these accounts are not rites or signs which express the prior unity of the people of God. They are rites and signs which themselves enact that unity, which make it real. They do not merely signify the religious ties that bind us together. They themselves bind those very ties. We aren't first united and then decide to sup together to show the world our unity. Rather, we come together with all our discordant, unsound, weakly dissonant human voices and backgrounds and practices, and in supping together, Christ makes us one in him. The rite does not reveal or refer to a prior oneness. It makes real that oneness in the ritual, it is a sacrament, not a sign, or not just a sign, but the real thing itself, or in other words, religio. For Paul, neither teachings, nor behaviors, nor doctrines finally bind us to God and to one another, but religion, reworked, reimagined, refreshed in and by and through Jesus Christ, does. Allow me then to close with a pecu peculiarly, though not exclusively Anglican question. If teachings and behaviors and doctrines and policies are not in the end what bind us together in Christ, then why should disagreements over teachings and behaviors and doctrines and policies so thoroughly rent us asunder? Thank you. Mm -hmm.